To get the two minute sequence, we ended up shooting for five weeks and we made 88 jumps during the period. About halfway through the sequence, my part ended because Bond takes the shoot and I go away with this horrible scream. And Bond is safe. And then, of course, comes Jaws. Time is running out, and so uh, I, uh, I go to pull my ripcord. And unfortunately, I just rip it right out of the parachute. But fortunately, there's a big circus going on, and I land on that and survive. Jaws always comes back. Yeah. Not many men could deal with a seven-foot villain with steel teeth flying towards them, but then again, there is only one James Bond. Remember that this is the man who emerged from the sea with a freshly pressed tuxedo under his wetsuit. Fashions fade, but 007 style is eternal. Here, buy yourself some decent clothes. Bond movies make the most fantastic reference point. They really are an absolute style guide. If you saw a Bond movie and didn't know which year it was made in, you could probably guess just by the sort of styles, very much of the moment. I approve. The fashions are very much up to the minute. Oh, not the wine. You're a frock. When people think of Bond, they think of the tux. Every guy who's ever got ready for a ball after they've tied the bow tie turns to the mirror. The guy's got to look well turned out in the tux. And they're made in a specific cut and style. It's like the bat suit, only it's the Bond suit. Bond is known for being a suit wearer, first and foremost, but in almost every film, he goes off on little tangents here and there into the realms of fashion. Not always very well advised, it has to be said. Sean Connery, quite early on in Goldfinger, appears in a blue toweling romper suit. Th that's Mr. Goldfinger, sweet. Yes, I know. In the time, not particularly outlandish. You're very sweet. Now, slightly suspect. Possibly the weirdest Bond fashion. You've had Connery, a Scot, for five films in a row, and you get an Australian Lazenby, and they give him a license to kill. George Lazenby's kilt, not so sure. It was an extreme fashion kilt by the looks of it. Slightly too many frills and bows. James, I need you. So does England. I love Roger Moore as Bond, but did he have to wear a yellow ski suit? Did he have to? Yellow? Banana, yellow. Secret agent, save the world in a yellow zip-up suit. Some people can look good in anything, dear boy. But not everyone appreciates the life and works of James Bond. After the break, things might just get a little nasty. Let me have me. You expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. I'm quite sure that not everyone's a fan of 007. He has done battle with some of the cinema's most infamous villains, people who seem hell-bent on taking over the world. Still, they have kept James Bond in employment for 40 years, so they can't be all that bad, can they? Let the mayhem begin. This is the part I really like. I've always had the power over man. Observe, Mr. Bund. The instruments of Armageddon. I think that the reason why the films are so successful has a great deal to do with the adversaries of Bond. Any cost, any, Bond must die. Let his death be a particularly unpleasant and humiliating one. They're all different. He seems fit enough. Every single one of them. 
I guess it's time to start cutting overhead. The audience needs to recoil from the villains. You need to just kind of, oh. You will snip the little finger on Mr. Barnes' right hand. This guy's really unpleasant. I wouldn't like to be in a room on my own with this geezer. But that means I would have to be dead. I think it's a very interesting point that so many of the villains in the Bond films are disfigured in some way, Dr. No with his iron hands. Well, give my not shaking hands. It becomes a bit awkward with these. The villains in Bond were always very visual. You know, there was the jaws with the, the steel teeth. And, and that, immediately, you knew he was a villain. I would describe him as a seven foot, 325 pound guy with steel teeth that he kills people with. But he's kind of like the uh, coyote in the Roadrunner and the Coyote. He just keeps coming. <laughs> Especially when Bond hits him uh, and the bong, you know, nothing happens. What do you know about a man called Scaramanga, 007? Scaramanga. The unusual physical characteristic that Scaramanga possesses is a third nipple. A what? A mammary gland. A third nipple, sir. You can have steel teeth, you can have, you know, a claw hand, whatever, but a third nipple? <laughs> it's, it's amazing, isn't it? I took the trouble to ask my doctor. I said, I'm going to play a part of the character who has a third nipple. I said, that sounds a bit weird. No, no, he said, not at all. It's far more common than people think. Five more turns and your neck will break. Another Bond villain trait is the lack of foresight to put a gun to 007's head and finish him off. The villain uh, wants to sadistically tease Bond by having him in a situation where Bond can't possibly escape to tell him about what he's going to do next. You're not a sportsman, Mr. Bond. Why did you break off the encounter with my pet python? I discovered he had a crush on me. Ah, he may have all the technology, he may have all the weapons, he may have all the money, but he's made a mistake here. His ego has let him indulge in a conversation with Bond. Despite your efforts, my finely wrought dream approaches its fulfillment. New York and Moscow will cease to exist. It is my oil. Ugh. Mine. And in the few seconds it takes for the villain to tell Bond what he's up to and how fantastic he is, Bond manages to escape. You're too late to game, Mr. Bond. You're not allowed to kill James Bond. It's a bad habit of yours. I had the gun in my hand, and did I shoot him? No. I may have some breaking news for you, Elliot. That wasn't very clever. Give the people what they want! We don't kill me. I begged to be allowed to kill him, but no. Of course, one of Bond's most dangerous enemies was a man who managed to remain unseen for a number of years. Indeed, we knew far more about his cat than we did about him. Well, it is time to find out how the film crew struggled with both of them as our countdown reaches number eight.